eyes fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by
We still live in a blessed land that we still know that we have people in this land that God still watches over and cares for. And we've got people in this land that still truly worship, like we're doing here this morning, that truly worship and truly feel free to worship the Lord in this place. Our founding fathers, our founding leaders had one primary goal when they came over here. And that was to make sure that every single person is gifted with something from their creator. And that gift is freedom. That we have been given a freedom through our Heavenly Father. And that's what they really instilled on us. And today, and I know things may change eventually in this country, but right now we still have certain freedoms. Would you agree with that? Right now we're still free to come to this place and still worship and to still pray and to sing songs and put it live on the internet so anybody can watch it. And in some countries, even name and name of Jesus is a death penalty. We have great freedom here. We have a freedom of some type of religion. Hope is our Christian religion. We have a freedom of sometimes the press. We have a freedom of sometimes saying what we want to say. But more importantly, God has given us His true freedom. And that's what today's message is truly all around is that topic of freedom. And do you know this? That in this Christian faith, Jesus gives us a freedom. It gives us a choice to make. We have the choice of how we want to spend our eternity. He gave us that freedom and that choice. He gave us that option that we can pick one of two places. And today is about that option. I pray that neither one of us or none of us will choose. We're in the book of Luke chapter 16. This is what God's Word says starting in verses 19. Now I fully believe this. If you would just give God just a few minutes this morning. I want to preach as slow as possible, as humble as possible, and as mean as possible. If you give the Lord about 20 minutes of your time this morning, He may just change your life. If you'll give God just a few minutes of your time this morning, you may leave here a totally different person. Here's what God's Word says in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously. That's a big word in it. That means he had a good time in his life. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. On the job, your workers to simply your mind us three simple words found in verses 23. Three simple words, and those words are this and in hell. I want you to picture this man for a minute. I read many commentaries about this. I read many preachers' theories about this. And many of them said, I'm going to cut this thing off. It's not working very good. I heard many theories about this. That this is simply just a parable that Jesus gave to his disciples. Well, name me a parable where Jesus mentions somebody by name. It mentions my father Abraham. This I truly believe is our Father, our Savior, our Christ telling a genuine story of something that literally happened but using it like an illustration. I believe everything in this simple passage is true. Of a rich man, of a man named Lazarus, and Christ is depicting from these two certain uh, great theological thoughts. But here's the word that says this man in verse 23, most saddest three words in this whole entire text, it says this man 
was in hell. He was a man given all kinds of freedoms. Look at the way he lived. He was dressed in purple and in fine linen. He had no problems, no needs. He lived in a great world in which he stayed in. But yet, he made the saddest decision of his life. We say this man had a choice to make. He could have chose the freedom to go to heaven, but he chose to go to hell. And here's this man's testimony. Can you imagine walking out the cemetery this afternoon? Seeing all the graves out there and all the letters on those graves, and some folks have nice little sayings under their names of it was, she was a great mother, or he was a great father, or forever now with Jesus. But if you were to see this man's tombstone, and here it is seared in the God's Word, on his grave, it says, and in hell. Can you imagine those words tattooed on your grave? And in hell. My goal this morning is so simple. My goal is for you to never have those words, those first three words as your testimony in life. Today we only know this rich man as one who went to hell. So throughout today's service we're going to look at what's going to happen and the things about this scripture, about this rich man that take place in his decision that he made. And that freedom he had, how he chose to do away with the freedom and chose to accept the worst. As a police officer, uh, sometimes I've, I've learned that some people just don't like going to jail. You notice that? I don't know what it is, but some folks just don't want to go. It's a free coffee. It's three field meals a day, and they even pay you for going. That's a pretty good little job. They pay you court fees for going. So it's a, it's a paid job. Why not go? But some people just don't want to go. And sometimes, um, unfortunately, you have to use force to put them in handcuffs, or sometimes you got to kind of Make them go with you, especially if you've done something terribly bad, you've got to make them go with you. And I hear this comment, I ain't heard it lately, praise God for that one. You see this comment all the time. Here the comment is, I ain't scared of you. I ain't scared to die. I hear that comment, I used to hear a whole lot. I can rest remember something simple, and they were like, come on, I ain't scared to die. And here's what my comment always was. I used to laugh at it. People used to laugh at me, especially my buddy cops. They said, why do you always say that? I said, I, I turned everything into a, you know, a, a religious thing. And so they say, I'm, not, I'm, I'm ready to die. I said, buddy, you're ready for the judgment. That's all I said to you. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to get ready for the judgment. Everybody in this room can probably say, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to die anytime soon, but yeah, I'm ready. If it happens, I'm ready for it. But the question to ask yourself is this. Are you ready for what happens after you leave this life? Are you ready for truly what happens after you leave here? Think about this. The Christ and God, the Holy Spirit, did everything possible to keep you out of hell. You realize that? That He literally gave His life. He did everything possible to keep you and to keep me and to keep our grandchildren and our children out of that place called hell. Think of what He did for us. Not only was he born of a virgin, but he also shed his innocent blood so that we will never have to face the judgment of hell. He took a cross. He took a crown of thorns on his head so we will never have to face the judgment of hell. He willingly surrendered his life and gave his life as a ransom so we never have to face the punishment of hell. He rose from the grave to defeat that hell. If we know that, why do so many people still in all these freedoms we have still make that choice to still go? God sends nobody there. It's our own actions. It's our own choice to go there. And here's this man making this exact same choice. I researched last week and there are nearly 2,000 places in God's Word where God is begging His people to repent so they will not be judged. That's God for the past 2,000 years, for lack of better words, saying, repent. I've got a better place for you. I've given you all this. I want to keep you out of this place called hell. And never forget this. Hell was never created 
for humanity. That was never God's plan for any of his man or any mankind ever to go to hell. But because of sin, it was made not for us, but it was first made, the Bible says in Matthew 25. Then he will say, those who are left in depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's who hell was made for. It was never made for us, but because of sin. And because of that willingness to continue in that sin, we now have to go. Well, my famous preacher, my favorite preacher of all time, so people might say Billy Graham or Joel Osteen. I have one even further back than that one. My favorite preacher of all time is Billy Sunday. You might heard him. Old preacher in the early 1900s up to about 1930. But he was a great man of God. And he made this comment. He said, hell is the highest reward that the devil can offer you for being a servant of his. Think of that. The, the best present the devil can give you is the gift of hell. I think I'll pass on that gift, if you don't mind. That's the best the devil can offer you is hell for serving him all these years. Now, we are living in a country that has a lot of freedoms, and, but in this world and in this country, we have a general knowledge of what hell and what takes place in that terrible place. Even those who were never raised in church have a, a skewed view. They still have a somewhat impression of what hell is going to be like. I this past week at one of those bar research things of I people actually believe about hell, of what they believe is going to take place there. And the consensus is kind of across the board of what we as Christians believe what takes place there. Here's one of the first ones. Hell is a place of eternal, eternal, you know how long eternity is? That's longer than yesterday. And yesterday's a long day. It's longer than it is eternal. There's no way they can picture it. It's infinite. Everlasting, non-quenchable fire. I'm not sure this what you mean. Know this already. After I got in the army, I wanted to be something in life. No, I'm just I wanted to, I wanted to be a firefighter. So I went to firefighting school, and after about a year, me and my wife and kids went down to Florida, right at the edge of Florida, near Fort Rome, and I was a firefighter for nearly one solid year. I hated that job, y'all. I'm not gonna lie to you. I hate it, but. I have my fair share, about three or four, not too many, but three or four house fires. And we get to go to these nice little house fires, and we get to stand out of the water hose. We're actually stood on top of the truck and fired the water hose at them. That's my job. But that was what I did. And these houses would catch on fire, these barns, or these sheds. I would sit there and keep adding that water to that fire. And after a while, finally, after the building collapsed a little bit, finally the fire was put out. And all the smoke was snuffed out. Everything was looked terrible, but the fire was out. But can you imagine going to a place the fire never stops burning? You can just feel the heat. The fire never stops burning. Also, the Bible says, and the, the general consensus is, that hell is a place of complete and utter torment. You thought being married was torment. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Come <laughs> on. I said, you look at your spouse. Complete and utter torment. The worst you can possibly ever imagine. It is a place of pain. It is a place of suffering, both spiritually and physically, but you're never consumed and never can stop for eternity. This is just some of the things that hell promises us for those who want to go. Hell is a place, it says, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we know what weeping is, right? We do it all the time. I cry all the time. But you know what national teeth means? I thought it meant pain, but it's totally not. If you read the New Testament verses when someone gnashed their teeth, like for instance, when Jesus told a parable, it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees gnashed their teeth against Jesus. What that means is they showed utter just contempt and anger at what Jesus is saying. Like Trinity's face right now. It's just anger. On that face. That's what that means. Can you imagine? Here's what's happening in hell. People are sitting there crying and they're completely miserable and mad and hating the fact that they're there. And they can blame no one but themselves. 
that they put themselves in that situation because they refused to accept the freedom that our eternal Father has given us. Hell is a place, even though it's full of fire and brimstone, the worst you possibly can imagine, it is still a place of dark abyss. I can't explain it. All knows the fires are burning internally, but it's still pitch black dark. It's an abyss that seems like it's a bottomless pit, the Bible says. Hell is completely opposite of the joy and the peace and the happiness that heaven is. And here's the best one. Hell is a no respecter of persons. My favorite things I love hearing on traffic stops, pull somebody over and the first thing they say is, do you not know who I am? My question always is, the response back is, give me your ID and I'll find out. But you don't know who they are. That's the great thing about hell is that you don't care how rich you are, how poor you are. There's no social statuses there. There's no... They're all on the same level in hell. Hell is also a real place. Just as we are in this one place here, it is a real, legit place. And going back to that respect your persons. I believe in hell. Here's what I believe is going to be there. I believe there's going to be adulterers and adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals and liars and cheaters there. I believe that. But I also believe there's going to be people who have the title of reverend. People who have the title and have hands laid upon them and says, I'm a deacon. People that have sung in choirs. People that have their names on church books, I believe is going to be there. That's why Jesus said that some will say to him in that final day, Lord, Lord, he will say, I knew you not. Depart from me. Because it's not about just believing in Jesus is what saves us. The Bible says even the demons believe in Jesus, but yet are unsaved. What it means is we fully put our full trust in him. And not just believe in him, but believe on him. For how great he actually is. And one day many people wake up and realize they never truly believed when they wake up like this rich man did. Watch what happens. This rich man says in chapter 16, this rich man died. Now catch this. This rich man died. And unless the Lord comes back to get us Every single one of her, every single person here was faced that exact same type of punishment that he faced if we don't get right with God. But look what happened to this man. Here he is living this freedom. He has his life the way he wants it. He has all the peace. He has everything he possibly can imagine in this world. And people say, why does it seem like people who are outside of God's will seem to be the most flourishing that he always says because the devil even takes care of his own also. But imagine millions and millions of people. They know how bad hell is going to be. They know what's lying there. They know what's waiting there for them if they refuse to get right. But they still choose to go there. And this rich man died. And it says here that after he died that he was buried. No doubt he was rich. No doubt he had family because somebody has to bury him. And it also says he had a father and some brothers. No doubt that he had a great huge funeral. No doubt he had all the mourners coming out from the villages. They all come by and pray by his body. No doubt they at, at his wake looked and said, oh, he was such a great man. No doubt he had the finest preachers ever preaching over his graveside service, but none of that mattered. Because once he's dead, he was gone. Tears were praying, uh, prayers were praying, tears were falling, but nothing saved that man after his eyes closed in death. Because it says he was dead and in hell. And it's so true that my, my people understand if we know how bad hell is. Why do people continue to still make a decision every day to go there? You know, he could have avoided hell. You know that? You know, he could have actually avoided going to that place. 
He spent 40 or 50 or 60 or knows how long years he was old when he passed away. He spent all these years serving one person. Serving himself. Then for eternity, he's in punishment. For you all eternity, he is in punishment. Now, all those three words read, look at verse 23 again. It says, and in hell. And in hell. I got a dear relative. I love him dearly. This dear relative, he was talking the other day and said that he fully believes that his mother right now is in hell. Truly literally believes it. I was by her bedside on her deathbed when she is abiding Christ into her heart only a few months ago as she is abiding Christ into her heart and in, in all my years of 38 years of being alive, she has never, not one time, ever told me she loved me as my aunt never told me she loved me. We're by her bedside and we're inviting Christ into her life. And when I got up, you know what she told me? The very first time I, I knew a change took place in her. The very first time ever she said, Daniel, I love you. I knew right then that she had really truly made that commitment. But her son says, I'm not quite sure Mama's in heaven. I believe she's in hell. We were talking. He says, I really, really don't even care much about church. I don't care about anything anymore. I just don't mind going to hell so I can be with Mama. How sad is that? But look what happened after, Lazarus, after the rich man died. It says after Lazarus died, he was taken by angels. He was taken to the bosom of Abraham. And we see a crowd there, don't we? Angels and Abraham are there. Who is with the rich man in hell? Nobody. There may be billions of folks there for all we know, but he is all by himself. Hell is not a place, no matter what the media tells you or this liberal world tells you, hell is not a place of parties. It's not a place of great reunions. It's not a place of celebration. You want that? Get right with God and celebrate heaven. Hell is total chaos, total destruction, the worst of the worst. And then it says, and in hell. This scripture is written when Christ spoke 2,000 years ago. And when Christ spoke it, I believe this rich man then was already in this place called hell. But you know where he's at today? He's still in hell. Now think of that for a second. 2,000 years ago, Christ gave this story about this rich man who had everything he possibly could want, all the freedoms this world could give him, but still chose to go to hell. And 2,000 years later, his testimony still is, he's still there. He's still in that place forever and ever and ever. I know what you're thinking. You're all believers here, and I can rejoice with you because of that. We're all fully believe. We've been in church our whole lives. We confess the Lord Jesus Christ. But can we all say some of our family has not? Some of our kin folks has not accepted that same salvation that we have. And knowing how bad things are in hell, are you doing everything you possibly can to show them Jesus through you? Are you trying your hardest to show the godly witness, whether they listen or not, you're still being that godly influence in their life. You're still being like Lazarus, who every single day was brought before the rich man. It was a living example every day of how bad things could be, but yet he still chose to ignore it. So maybe you're going to heaven, and praise God you are. But then a lot of this world is not. And it's up to us to be that bright, shining example to show the world the error of their way and to show there's a better place than where they're headed. And the last part is this. I want to show you four quick similarities of this world today and this rich man. Four similarities between this rich man and the world today. The first thing is this. This rich man, he was a blessed man but he went to hell anyway. Can we say we're a blessed people? 
In this country, we're taken care of. We all have money in the bank account. Whether it's a dime or a quarter, we all got something in the bank account. God watches over us. He protects us. We still have certain freedoms that's given to every single one of us. We are people who are highly blessed than the rest of a lot of people in this world. But that's not enough. In this life, it says this rich man dressed sumptuously. It means every single day he woke up and dressed the best. He only went shopping at the best place. If he were alive today, he'd live in the mansion downtown. He would have the house beat the, the beach houses on the beach. He'd have the riverfront houses. He'd drive the nice cars, have all the beautiful luxuries in life. He would shop at not Walmart, guys. He would not be caught dead in Walmart. But this is the kind of life this guy lived. He had all the blessings. And people could look at this guy and say, Wow, he truly is blessed because of all the things he has. But those possessions are not what makes you saved. All those blessings will eventually fade away. The moss will destroy. He was a blessed man, but he went to hell anyway. Also this. He was given a chance daily to get right, but he went to hell anyway. The Bible says that Lazarus was carried. I mean, somebody had to pick him up and carry Lazarus every single day and to set him at the gate at the rich man's house daily. And here's this rich man living in all the luxuries and looking out his bedroom window or walking out getting his nice chariot or he rides around in and every day has to pass by Lazarus and he sees the slow death of Lazarus. How he starts out is hungry. And he's just begging for food from his table. Just the crumbs. Then he starts developing sores. Then it got so bad that even the dogs come and start licking the sores of Lazarus. And we see how unhumble this rich man is. He can't even shoot the dogs away. He can't offer the man any kind of ointment for his Wounds. He can't even offer him the crumbs from his table. He is not willing to lower himself down to help nobody. It's all about him. And Christ gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to help somebody less fortunate. Remember that verse that says that, that, that you care for him when I was in prison, and you visit when I was sick. You care for the stranger. This is what Lazarus tainted was to him. He was that opportunity for, the, um, for that rich man to humble himself down. To show that he concerned. To show love. To show compassion like Christ showed upon us. And every single day he was given the opportunity. But he went to hell anyway. And I fully believe this. That one day this whole entire world that happens to make that decision to go there. It's going to see ugly preachers like me in their minds. And ugly deacons like y'all in y'all's minds telling people that Jesus is the only way. That hell's hot. And they look at all the times those preachers and those teachers and those God, mainly, mainly God of women stood up and says, you need to get right. And they think all the times they heard that message and ignored it. The Bible says we're not promised to hear the gospel all times. But right now, the gospel is presented. Unless you get right with God, or repent of your sins, this place is reserved for you. Also, it says he was a loved man. He was a highly loved man. But he went to hell anyway. We know no doubt as a rich man, he had many servants. The Bible said he had a father. He had at least five brothers. No doubt he had someone to bury him. So no doubt somebody had to have loved this guy. But no matter how much love he had in his life, he still went to hell anyway. And the last one is this one. Believe it or not, this man was a religious man. But still went to hell anyway. Preacher, I can mean, say that he went to hell. He wasn't very religious. Yeah, he was. Watch what the Bible says. Three times in that whole entire narrative, you'll see where he says, Father Abraham. Then once he calls him father. Then a third time he says, But Father Abraham, send Lazarus back to my brothers. Three times he calls him Father Abraham. 
That means he has a relationship with that, Jew, that, that uh, Jewish religion that he knew that Abraham was his spiritual father. He was no, he was raised knowing. He was probably raised in a Sunday school and raised in the Sabbath school, you'll call that one. And raised him that his spiritual father, and he is from a line of, of Israel. He is from Abraham himself. He knows that he is of God. He was raised that way, knowing that my family is of the lineage of Abraham. He calls him father. He knows where he comes from. Like the members say my church is my name's on church book my great great grandmother went there name's on the exact same book hers is does it matter what church your name's on does it matter if the church didn't name it after you all that matters where your name is written in the last book of life this is a very very religious man called Abraham his pure father but he still went to hell anyway so what keeps us out of that place what keeps us out of that place called hell? Only one thing. Not really a thing. One Savior. His name is Jesus. And it's confessing Him as our Lord. Confessing Him as our Savior. Believing His death, burial, resurrection. And inviting Him to be the God of our life. I always believe this. You're going to serve somebody. At the old song my Bob Dylan used to go, you're going to serve somebody. Whether you serve the devil, but you serve the Lord, you're going to serve somebody. And don't be like this rich man and make this your testimony. And all that you remember for is three words. And in hell. What's going to be your testimony? Hopefully mine, I know mine's going to say it, hopefully yours is too. And in heaven, he's rejoicing with the angels. Father God, we love you this morning. Thank you for letting us be your children. Thank you for watching out for us and caring for us. And Father, I do pray for those who have never heard the message, Father, never accepted you in their life. They don't wait for us too late to accept you. Lord, hell is a prepared place, but so is heaven. Heaven is a place prepared for those who love the Lord and anticipate His coming. Father, we pray for you. Your spirit right now, Father, move among us. Help us to be better ministers to our family and our friends that we can get those around us, Father, to escape this judgment that is to come. In Christ's name, we pray.